As if tonight was not special enough with Veterans Day and food. Um, we do have a special guest with us here tonight. Maybe I'll just, maybe I'll wait a little bit because there's a lot going on. But um, Rachel's excited, evidently. I'm excited too, Trish. Trisha. Why don't you go ahead and come up here, Trisha? <laughs> Hi. Hi, friend. This is Trisha Collins. While all the kids are getting to their classes, we'll uh, just make a little small talk here. Yay. Uh, I get to see Trisha's face every Thursday morning. She's part of my Toastmasters club. But uh, she actually, I got to know you through Joanna, really, because yeah. y'all were in BSF together. Bible study fellowship. Yeah. And um, I was kind of waiting to do this until all the kids got out, mainly because one of the things that we all kind of know what we're dealing with, uh, with COVID and all the shutdowns and all this stuff is kids that are caught at home. Right? Uh, she's, she's with Childbridge. And if you don't know Childbridge, it is, I'm going to let her tell you all about it. But it's all about being the church to fatherless children. Right? Yes. Whether you foster them or whether you adopt them. Yep. Y'all are that bridge between the foster care system and the church correct is that enough that's it is yeah. that on i, I think, think it's it i think enough. is it on can you hear her no. i'll give you a different mic well it's on it's on okay it's me it's all good me. deal and i was just thinking as as these kids are at home and the part of what we're hearing about is just the child abuse that is happening with all of this mess that's going on so uh, she's going to share her heart with us for uh, the fatherless. So I'll give her your attention for about 10 minutes, okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I wonder, have you heard of the church in Strasbourg, France? During the war, they received a lot of bombing. And after the war was over, they went and they surveyed their property. And one of the things they were looking for was this beloved sculpture they had of Jesus. It had been made centuries earlier, and it was so important to them. And as they sifted through the rubble and they found this sculpture, what they didn't know was beams had literally sheared off the hands of Jesus. And as they met to discuss what would they do, the elders and the pastor, there was a sculptor in their congregation who offered to make new hands for it. And as they prayed and as they thought about it, in the end, they chose not to have the sculptor do that because they decided it would be more powerful to put an inscription at the bottom of it. That's a quote from a poem of St. Teresa of Avila that says, I have no hands but yours. He doesn't have a body here anymore. He doesn't have hands here anymore. We are his hands. We are his body. And we are that for hurting children. It's very difficult for me to say, but I know it to be a fact that I have to tell you right now at this very moment, there are children being abused and neglected right here in our community. There are children hiding under beds, in closets, afraid of the very people that God entrusted to love and care for them. And that's where Childbridge comes in. Our mission is to find and equip foster and adoptive families for Montana children who have suffered abuse and neglect. We believe that God's word is clear. Hundreds of times it commands us to care for the orphan and to care for the fatherless and children that are in the foster care system are orphaned. They are fatherless, whether it be temporarily in foster care, some of them permanently needing adoption. So what does Childbridge specifically do? We're super laser focused. We have two prongs, two things we do. One is find, and the way we do that is exactly what I'm doing here tonight. We just say what God's word says, and we ask people to obey it. We find, and then we equip those families because we know that it's not the easiest thing to do, and we truly believe that God asks us to equip you to do it. Most of us who work on staff all have fostered and adopted ourselves, so we come at it with experience 
and we share that experience with you. So if right now your heart is beating fast and you know God's asking you to respond and you don't have a clue what that looks like, yay, that's why God sent me here. (laughs) That's exactly my job and exactly what I'm to do. So what is our vision? Our vision is really simple as well. We believe that every child deserves a family. All children who need a family deserve one, and we believe that all children should have a family. And so in our slide here, every single one of those, those are families that were found by Childbridge who stepped in. And, you know, there's a teenage mom who needed to learn how to be a mom, and so there's a family that took her in and her girl and is teaching her how to be a mama. There's one, Orion here, shook so violently when he was six months of age. He's a quadriplegic. He'll never... (laughs) move beyond what his body was capable of at six months of age, but he's bigger. And Childbridge was able to go into a Christian church and ask, would you care for him? And somebody's doing that. They step forward to what God asked them to do. Every single one of these children was found by Childbridge through the Christian church. So what does it look like to stand for the powerless? Why would we do this? And what does a family look like? I want to just not say numbers. I hate just saying, oh, there's 300 of them in Missoula. There's 3,000 of them in Montana. That doesn't mean a whole lot. I want to tell you about just one. And her name was Holly. And little Miss Holly was in need of a family. And she was over here in foster care. And then over here, I was meeting with the Petersons, Matt and Katie. And Matt and Katie had one kiddo already, sweet little Miss Audra. And they really wanted more children. They were praying, and God was not providing that through natural means. And then they heard about us, and they heard about foster care, and they felt it on their heart. But they didn't really want to do it. They'll tell you that truthfully. They really just wanted to have kids of their own, but they felt that, and they obeyed what God asked them to do. And so little Miss Holly would come into their family, fit like a glove, be a little sister to their child, be there for a year and a half. Looks like it was moving towards adoption, and and they were happy about that. And then all of a sudden... If you pull back and you get God's picture, the 30,000-foot view of the whole thing, there's somebody else in the picture, and his name is Zach. And Zach is her biological father, who for a while didn't do the things he needed to do to regain her. But then all of a sudden, on one day, he decided to start doing the right things and to do everything he needed to do to regain her. And he was consistently doing that, and he was doing everything he could, but he really didn't know how to be a parent. And the next thing you knew, Matt and Katie found that God was asking them to teach Zach how to parent his own daughter. Can I tell you that's pretty spectacular obedience? Because if he was successful, they would lose this little girl and their family that they love so very much. But you know, that's what they did. Every single week when they went on visits, they taught him, here's what Holly likes. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. And he would fight for her and he would regain her. And that is truly at the heart of Childbridge because we believe it's at the heart of the father. Children are placed in families that's sacred. And we really believe they should be back in that family if at all possible. But that's only possible through people doing what Matt and Katie did. And I asked Zach, I called him and I said, can I tell your story in churches? Because it's powerful. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I would love for you to do that. And he's not a Christian yet. (laughs) yet. And I said, well, what do you think about Matt and Katie? You know, if I could share with people, what did you think about them? And he said, well, the truth is at first I was really mad at them. They had my baby girl. And then he said, but today I can tell you they're the most remarkable people I've ever met in my entire life. And that they helped me get my baby girl back and they still help me. And they're still such an important part of our family. And they still meet with him. They still do birthdays together at the park. And it's a pretty special thing. So what if you and I just listen to everything I say and you just say, oh, that's a sweet ministry that Trisha has over there, what she's doing to help these kids. What if you and I cross the threshold of that door over there and we do absolutely nothing? We just say, oh, that was an interesting thing that they shared. And I'm so glad they're into that. Less than 50% of the kids will graduate high school that are in foster care. One in four will be homeless. That's a big number. 77% will be arrested. 
huge number if you think about that that trajectory where their life is headed. 71% will become single mothers. So the fatherlessness will be perpetuated. I always hear the statistic as well that uh, like 98% of people on death row were in foster care. I mean, this abuse and neglect where it heads without Jesus intersecting with it is all not good places, but for God. So at Childbridge, as I said, we find and equip foster and adoptive families. So I want to tell you one more story. This one's hard for me because I got to help to find her family, so I can't ever tell it without crying. She's a special girl. So at Chowbridge, we specifically partner with the state of Montana because that's where the kids are. They're in foster care to help find these families. And sometimes I get to meet the kiddos right out of the gate, especially the ones that it's harder to find a family for. I want to meet them. I want to hear their stories so that when God shows me who the family is, I, I know that's the connection that's being made. So I sat down at a coffee shop, dog and bicycle, with little Miss Zoe, who was 15 at the time, and I just asked her her story. Tell me your story, baby girl. She proceeded to spill it out and uh, horrifically profound abuse and neglect at the hands of her parents. Things I can't even say. They're just unspeakable. And then she said, I've been through 23 foster homes. And I'm listening. And then she said, I really struggle in school. I said, why do you struggle in school? Super honest. She said, I smoke pot. Why do you smoke pot? Because I'm trying to just numb out the pain. It's been really painful. My life has been really painful. And in my head, I'm thinking, wow, you are so honest. I can work with you. <laughs> you know, when you're honest like that, you're not blaming anybody else. You're just telling me the truth. And then I thought to myself, I said, oh, I wanted to just sob when you hear a story like this. You just want to sob, but that's not going to be helpful for her. <laughs> so I pray inside. I said, Lord, what would you have me tell her? right in this moment. And he said, tell her your story. I was like, oh, yes, Lord, I'll do that. And I said, well, when I was 15 and a half, I was in foster care. And I had been through at least 19 homes, if not more. And a Christian family stepped into my life. And they were my family forever, and they still are to this day. And I named my child after them when I fostered and adopted myself. And then the next thing came out of my mouth as I prayed. I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth. And I said, and I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to look for a family for you. I was like, oh, did I just say that? Yikes. <laughs> Not going to be easy to find one for her. But I prayed. And while I was doing that, I was also meeting with this family that was struggling to get their foster care license. But they felt absolutely confident they were supposed to. And they were hitting every barrier possible. The state had told them no numerous times, and we would stop and we would pray because they felt like it. And then we were in a coffee shop. I can tell you it's on Brook Street. It's the City Brew. And I was just metaphorically throwing out an example. I said, well, if your license goes through and you get a kid like Zoe, and they both, their eyes just locked on each other, and they looked at me like as if they'd seen a ghost. And I was like, what? And they said, why'd you say Zoe? <laughs> so well, Zoe's deep in my heart. I try and find a family for her every day. He said, no, 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 because that's the one God told us about. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, Lord, let's, <laughs> let's keep walking down this. So I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story. I've got a little video that I want you to see. Zoe is now with that family, and recently, this is the day when she got her new last name, and they were surprising her. Alex, can you roll that video for me?
that's what God can do with a little girl who's been through 23 families and wanted to have nothing to do with any of them because she'd been so hurt. This time she asked, could she please become one of them? Because they have Christ in them, and they're obeying him. And is it easy? No. <laughs> it's actually super hard. But they have Childbridge, and we're helping them pretty consistently. <laughs> it's a pretty special story, but that's what God can do in each one of these kids' stories. And every single one of them deserves a family. So what am I asking you to do when I'm here? I'm asking you, first off, if you'd foster the elephant in the room, I will state it. I'm asking if you would do for one of these children what was done for me, what was done for Zoe. I want to just give you one scripture to consider. It's James chapter 1, verse 27. It says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Basically, God says, this is perfect work. <laughs> this is the worship I want. You can sing songs all day long, but what I really want is for you to take care of those who can't take care of themselves. And so I do ask that you partner with us. Not everyone can foster, and we understand that. Not everyone is called to it. It is a calling. There are other ways you can partner and participate with us. You can give. We are completely funded by private Christian donations from individual people. We do not take a single penny from the government because we want to be true to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a huge budget we have. We don't charge the families anything for what we do. We literally raise two and a half million dollars every year to do what we do, but it comes through because God believes in this ministry. We still have a big shortfall this year. We trust that God will provide that through his people. If he's asking you to foster, grab my card off the table. I'll be back at the table. It always starts with coffee. I buy the coffee. I like good coffee. I'd just be happy to just to sit down and chat with you. I've got a good friend at my home church. She says, I'm never having coffee with you, Tricia. <laughs> <laughs> Little does she know that the gal that works at Starbucks prays over every family I meet with. She knows me too. She knows what I'm doing there. I leave you with that quote from the beginning, the rest of the poem from St. Teresa of Avila. She put it so well. She says, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Please consider partnering with us. We'd really appreciate it. Every child does deserve a family. Thank you, Tricia. I want to pray for you before you go, and I'd encourage and challenge each one of us to at least figure out what God wants us to do with it. He may not be calling you to foster, but he calls you to pray. He might be calling you to pray and give. He might be calling you to do all three. He's asked me to do all three. <laughs> so I want to just pray over you and your ministry and our church family how we're supposed to respond here, okay? Father, we just uh, lift up this ministry to you, and we thank you for Tricia. We thank you for your story and her life, how you brought her through foster care and now to be an advocate for uh, children that don't have parents. And I just pray for each child that's in our foster care system that they would find a home and that they would find a Christian home. Lord, um, would you just bless this ministry and bless the work of Trisha's hands that you would just um, bring her couples um, from every direction that uh, you have called and I pray for our church uh, that you, you might call up some folks from this church to foster as well and maybe even possibly adopt uh, that would give, that would pray. Uh, Lord, this is, this is close to your heart and uh, help it to be close to ours and that we would be obedient in it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Friend. Thank you. We're going to jump right into uh, tonight's message. You know, we've been in this series, But Why, for several weeks now. And uh, it's funny because I've been having, I just run into people that are like, so what series are you in? I've never had anybody ask me really what series we're in. And these are people not in the church, but uh, pastor friends of mine or whatever. And um, it's, this is something that's been close on our hearts and minds as we've been here now for uh, six years and just really as the church just stop and take account and and really ask ourselves why do we do what we do does some of it ever seem odd to you i read a book years ago if you want to read it 
uh, I would proceed with caution. It's called pagan Christianity. And it really questions why do we do the things that we do uh, in the American church or even the church as a whole. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, and it talks about it in that book, and I say proceed with caution because you, it's real easy to get down on the, the American church and use it as a way to beat up your pastor. Please don't do that. Um, but it really does give us a, a good idea of what is church and what isn't and what are the origins of all these things. But uh, we're looking at why do we go to church? You know, I'm saying this to a bunch of people that just came to church, you know. So I don't know why you come to church. The, uh, different people have different reasons. Um, a group called um, the Pew, the Pew Poll, they did a, a survey of, I think, about 4,200, 4,300 Americans and found that uh, the number one reason is they want to be closer to God. It's a pretty good reason. As we go through these top few, they really resonate as, as good things. They wanted their children to be raised with a moral foundation. They wanted to become a better person. Uh, they wanted comfort in times of sorrow. As we get down toward the bottom of it, they become things that maybe aren't as solid. Maybe they're not as good a reason to, to go to church. They felt obligated to. That's not, is you're a kid and your parents are making you go or somebody's giving you a guilt trip? It's not a great to, to continue a family's religious tradition. That's not a bad reason, but it shouldn't be the only reason. Good reason is to be a part of a faith community. To please their family or their spouse or partner. Reasons that people didn't go to uh, church are, that's a really long list. And as I think about why people, a lot of people don't go to church, uh, at least as, as Joanne and I have come here, and we've met people, there's a lot of people that have experienced church hurt. They get hurt in the church, and, and they, they just want to run from it, and they, they stop trusting the church. They stop trusting people in the church, and that's tragic. But when we're talking about this, we don't want to talk about necessarily his opinion or her opinion or my reason or your reason. We want to look at Scripture, and we want to look at what the Bible says about why we should go to church. You know, as a little boy, I didn't have an option. It was what we did. My dad was the music director at our church. So the music director went, and so did his son and his other son until we adopted my sister, and then we all three went. But that was just our life. That was our culture. When it came time for me and Joanna to get married and have kids, it's something we realized was valuable in our lives. Uh, it, but it followed a lot of these things. It was a family tradition. It was We wanted our kids to be good kids. You know, raise a child in the way he should go, and he, shall not in the, and he should, won't depart from it. I'm paraphrasing. But as we think about this, and we look at Scripture, and we think about why do we go to church, like especially in today's day and age when churches have been shut down for a little while, we couldn't even meet. Um, there are some states that are telling churches you still can't meet, you can't sing, you, can't, you have to wear a mask when you sing, all these crazy things. It makes us wonder, it makes us question, it makes us decide ah, maybe church isn't all that important. Maybe it's not. But we should look past, as, as we stated in the first uh, sermon in this whole, this whole study, We've got to look at, if we trust God's Word, that it is God's Word, and that it's true, and it's going to guide our lives, then when we look at an idea of why should we go to church, then that's where we should look to find the answer. And when God is, when Jesus had come down to this earth, you remember um, Jesus turning to the disciples and saying, you know, who do people say that I am? Right? And everybody had this answer and that answer. But Peter turned around and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him and says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. The gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church. Now you and I are individual believers, and what, I, what I'm afraid has happened in today's age is we become so focused on, this is my relationship. 
you know, I can, I can go do this and I can worship God in this way, but, and, and I I'm, I'm retain my faith. And that may be true, but God hasn't called us to be lone rangers. He's not called us to be people that are isolated out there and go it alone. He's called us to be the church, and that's a collective thing. That's why we're here tonight. I understand at the same time I say that there's a lot of obstacles as to why we don't get to come. I'm, I'm hopeful that we removed one of those obstacles tonight. We brought food. Right? And it's not that food's a must, but when you're working two people at a job with kids all day, you, you got to wear a mask all day. You come home, you can either run home, fix a meal, and try and come back to church. You can go, I'm exhausted. And you stay home. And I said, enough's enough. I'm not looking for a pat on the back. I'm just trying to say, I don't want to have put any barriers up that would keep people from coming to church. But you coming here just to check a box isn't the point. When, when Jesus was, had ascended into heaven and he told his disciples, we're going to be over in Acts 2 at first if you want to turn over there. We have this moment of Pentecost where they started speaking in all these various languages and Peter preaches this sermon, this stellar sermon, and thousands of people come to Christ. And then at the end of chapter 2, there's this description of what the church was doing at that time. And I want to read this, and I want to contrast this based on what we tend to do in the American church today. And I want us to just really look at what is present in today's church and what is missing. And I would say if there's anything that's present that is not named here, maybe we don't have to worry about doing it. Because quite honestly, if it's not in the Bible to say you've got to do this, then I don't really got to do it. Does that make sense? So I want to read verse 42 through 47. And I want us to take note of what is said here, because when we look at why we should go to church, I don't want you to come to church because your pastor says, I miss you. Okay? When you don't come to church, I miss you. But that's not a guilt trip. I just want, it's hard for a pastor to say I miss you and have it not feel like a guilt trip. Say, so if I ever see you outside of church and you haven't been to church, I do miss you. And not because we didn't get to write a number down on a stupid piece of paper. Okay? It's because this is one of the main times that I get to see everybody that I know and love. So selfishly, I have reasons why I'd want you to come to church, but more importantly, for the greater good of the kingdom of God. It says here in verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Part of the reason that I wanted to bring back the meal is because we were missing our fellowship. We launched small groups, but people really haven't signed up for them. And that's a way that we could get fellowship. And I want to keep encouraging you guys to sign up for a small group. Don't worry about signing up. Just find out where they're at and show up. If there's a meal, you might want to let them know you're coming. But they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. I'm not an apostle. If I, if I, as I look at uh, Ephesians 4, I think I fall into the category of pastor-teacher. Shepherd, teacher. That's kind of where I think I fall in. But devoting themselves to the, the teaching of the apostles and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, hello, pizza's bread, and prayers. As you look at what the church did, not what the church was, the church is made up of believers. They are people. Collectively, everybody that is, is a believer and a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of the universal church, Big C Church. But it's hard for me to understand how we can expect to be a part of the Big C Church without being identified with a little C Church and to be a part of it. I'm in Toastmasters with Tricia. It's like I paid my dues but I never do anything with it. 
how much of a Toastmaster am I in name only? So there's an aspect of this that we've got to involve ourselves in the body of Christ. Why? Not because Peter said so. But we come together so that we can grow in Christ. Hopefully, I'm obeying the Lord in what I preach, and what I preach inspires you guys to go on your own and grow even more. I hope that my preaching is not all that you're depending on. Because that's one time a week for about, well, depends on the week, how long it is. But we're to fellowship together. We're to break bread together. That, to me, that's doing life with each other. And we're supposed to pray for each other. Last uh, Monday, we had our small group, and we're, we're a new small group. We're kind of new to each other. And I asked for prayer requests, and it was pretty quiet. And one of the guys in the group, a, a, a wise, wise man, said, you know, in 10 weeks our prayer time is going to look different because we'll know each other and we'll trust each other. And it takes that time. But that's the importance of really having genuine relationships with each other. You don't get that, quite honestly, even by showing up every Wednesday night. You get that by doing life with each other. It says here in verse 30, uh, 43, I trust that not all these verses are going to take this long. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking the bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. They were coming together. And because they came together and did what the church was supposed to do, to be together and to fellowship and to pray for one another, God blessed them. He did amazing things through them. He laid it on their hearts. Now, how many of you would be willing to sell your ATV and give me the money? Jacob, you don't have an ATV. <laughs> it's real easy to say, yeah, I'd do it when you don't have one. You know. How In our American culture, think about it. I wasn't really asking for donations. How many in our American culture, if somebody really had a need, would sell something that they had and give the money to that need? That, that's like a foreign idea today. And I'm not saying that we should all just sell all of our stuff. Maybe we should. I don't know. What's God leading you to do? I don't know. In our American culture, it's hard to know of needs that are that big that would take that. But guys... In this church, one thing that I recognize is when somebody has a need, people step up to meet it. I see it. One thing that I don't, it, it's been hard for me, is to really have a finger on the pulse of who is in need. Who out there is in need? Because I guarantee you there's more people out there that are in need than what we know about. And God calls us to meet those needs. There's needs in this church of people that don't really want to say anything. The church is here to meet each other's needs, to come alongside each other. When somebody calls them and says, hey, I have an elk down, can you come help pack it out? Now, there can be a little selfish motivation in that that you want to get part of it. I don't know. But that's a way that we can help each other. The bottom line is God has called us to come together. Why? It's so he can do great things. Let's look over at Romans, and this is really because... It's one thing to know a fact like that, like, okay, great, Peter, you, you read that, and now I know what happened there, and we're supposed to do some version of that here. But what part do I play? In America, we are all very much focused on us as an individual, are we not? What does Peter do? What's Peter's hobby? Uh, who is Peter? <laughs> heard that all my life thank you peter the pumpkin eater evidently <laughs> miss miss kaylee with our comedic humor up here thank you for that peter the pumpkin eater peter 
Rabbit, Peter Pan, Zipperonis, you know, take your pick. But, but you in particular, why, why is it important that you're here? Look over at Romans 12. Because we know that if we study God's Word, and, and if we've read this before, let's just assume none of you have, and I'm going to read it. And I hope that it makes sense, because we're going to go on to Hebrews 10, and it's going to tie together even more so. Because here in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, he says, For by grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and in individually members one of another. Did you catch that? We're all individuals brought together as the body of Christ, but we're also individual members with each other. That means we don't go this alone. That means that Peter doesn't, it, it's not just Peter out here by himself. And what I do doesn't affect anybody else. It means that everything I do affects you, and everything you do affects me. Because we're members one with another. I'll have to find my place again. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in portion to your faith, if service uh, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here's my problem with the American church today. Most people that come to church have kind of just assumed, because I think the church has taught you this at some level, that you come, you sit in a chair, and you're either inspired or somewhat entertained. You sing some songs, and you go home. And that's your role as a Christian in this church. God says, no. I have given each and every one of you special gifts and when those gifts aren't present, then the body can't work together like it's supposed to. It's like trying to go out hunting and you didn't take your gun. Somebody's, I don't know where that came from, but somebody, somebody's the gun. Or you go on a hike, but you don't have any feet. The Bible talks about feet. You can't all be feet. We're all part of one body. And if we're not all here together, how can we function as the church? This is not a guilt trip, guys. I'm trying to look at God's Word and inspire you guys as, as well as myself. I kind of have to be here every week. But we've got to function together. We're not all individual parts that just choose to be a part of uh, this neat club. We are a part of a body, and we're to function together to carry out the purpose of the body. The purpose of the body is the Great Commission, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And we do that in very different ways, because I'm different from Stephen, who's different from Ryan, who's different from Gina and Aaron and Diane, and I'm going to list everybody's name here tonight. But we're all different. God made us different, and he gave us different gifts and passions. And he gives somebody the ability to, to make money and be generous and give it away. And, and he gives somebody else that may not have much money, but they love to serve. And they, they're here all the time giving of themselves. And let me tell you something. Our church serves well. Our church serves probably better than a lot of churches I've been in. The statistics are 80-20. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. But I think this whole COVID thing has gotten us so wound up that we have retreated in and we've become individualized again. We've quarantined ourselves off to where we still believe what we believe, but we're not participating the way we're supposed to participate. We're not fulfilling the function that God has gifted us to fulfill and called us to fulfill. Because if that part's not there, 
Instead of running on our feet, we've got to crawl on our knees. Why should we go to church? Because we're not going to be able to function as the church if we don't come together as the church. I want to look over at the, this last section in Hebrews 10. And I'm going to try and be brief on it. I'm going to try and summarize most of it. There's two verses we're going to focus on. But basically, in the whole section from 19 through 39, it talks about how we should have this assurance of our faith and stand in that assurance. And then it goes on to talk about what if we just have this faith that we don't do anything with. It's like slapping Jesus in the face. And so I'm going to read verses 24 and 25, and then I'm going to read 32 through the end. But I want us to focus on, this is the famous verse. If anybody ever says, well, you should go to church. Why? Well, because it says in Hebrews 10, 25, that you should not forsake the gathering together, which some do. Okay, that's the famous verse that everybody wants to pull to use God's word, maybe to get you to do what they want you to do. But honestly, if his word says it, and it's true, and it's what he wants us to do, then shouldn't we do it? So let's read here in verse 24 and 25, and if you think about what the church did, and then what part you are to play with your own giftedness and how God designed you to function within the body of Christ, now look at verse 24. It says, And let us consider how to stir one another up for love and good works. And then it says, I wish they would say the first part when they say, Why should I go to church? Right there in verse 24. 25 is great too, but 24 is really the answer. Let us hold, sorry, I went back too far. Let us consider how to stir one another up for love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as the, is, is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Other translations will say, do not forsake the assembling together. You've heard that? Here's the thing about assembling things. What do you do when you assemble something? You put it together. What if I had all the pieces of a pocket watch in a plastic bag? Would that make it a pocket watch? Would it function? Would it tell me time? You got the hands and the gears and all the cogs and the face and the back and the chain and the, the winding, all of the parts, they're all in there, but it's not assembled. I, is it a pocket watch? No. You have everything, every element that you need to have a pocket watch, but you don't have a pocket watch because they're not all assembled together, functioning how we're made to function. That's why we need to come to church. That's why we need to not just show up on Wednesday night and do, our, and do that part. It's even doing stuff off-site, small groups. Doing church is learning, studying God's Word. It's praying together. It's fellowshipping. It's doing life together. It's playing our part. That's why we have to come together. But I want to read this last part here, 32 through 39, because it's... it's pretty heavy and as i think about where we're at in this day and age i think that this really applies to us it says but recall the former days he's talking to the hebrews he's talking to the the jews that have faced persecution right it says but recall the former days when after you were enlightened you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction and sometimes being partners with those so treated for you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one therefore do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward for you have need of endurance anybody need endurance these days I wake up every morning and go, Lord, I need endurance. Help me to just get through today. This is, 2020 is getting old. 
I, I have a heart, I have a bad feeling that 21, 2021 is not going to be all that much better. I don't think it's going to let up. I think we're going to be just fine because God's in control, but I think it's, we're going to need some endurance. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And here he's going to talk about, so use some words from Isaiah. He says, yet for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. Amen. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And the last verse is what got me. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their souls. Guys, we're in a time in our country, in our world, where Christianity, I would say, is probably more under attack than it ever has been, at least in America. Our country, our American way of life is under attack. Especially as we sit here on Veterans Day, and, and I think of all the veterans that I'm looking at here that fought for our freedom. And you look at what's going on in the country today and you think, man, this is not what I fought for. This way of life that's being pressed on us is not what we fought for. It's heartbreaking. But there is a cause that supersedes even the American dream. And as we sit here today, and I'm almost done, just so you know. As we sit here today, I would ask you this. Whatever your profession is, whatever you call yourself as your title, pastor, baker, tax seller, I don't know, is that what you do? You sell tack, right? Sorry, wrangler. I'll just call you a wrangler. And moving on. Whatever your occupation is, she's giving me looks. Whatever your occupation is, ask yourself, when, when you think to identify yourself, do you identify yourself as that title, or do you identify yourself as Christian? I, I heard a, a wise man um, tell a story about how God, when God called him into ministry, the man that had been discipling him asked him, he says, so what are you going to do? And he said, well, I've got an engineering degree, so I figured I'd be an engineer. It's kind of logical. He said, well, that's great. Are you going to be an engineer that's a Christian? Or are you going to be a Christian that just happens to be an engineer? And I would ask that of each of you. Are you, your occupation, is that your identity, who's also a Christian, or are you a Christian that just happens to have this occupation? Because the way God wants us to live our life is that He can give us many different occupations. He, we can earn a living doing many different things. But He has called us first and foremost to be His child, His warrior on the battlefield. And if that is our calling, that we must assemble. We must assemble and study. We must fellowship. We must pray together. We must be the church to where He can accomplish what He wants to accomplish through us because everybody, all the skills that He needs right here in this church are here so He can use us for His kingdom and for His glory. Let's pray.